Good evening, everybody. Hello, hello. Welcome to another episode of Critique Corner with me, Daniel Parker. And me, DB Fastbinder. And uh, let me just say, the algorithm... I don't know what the algorithm gets excited about. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, like seriously, we, we, can't, we had a review of X-Men 97 last week, but the Blank Man one got more reviews. Or more views. Like, that... What? Yeah. What? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well. Yeah. We will continue to just review whatever the heck we feel like and let the chips fall where they may. Indeed. Yes. And um, of course, our reviews this week are 1980s comedy classics. So, yes, which are which are fun. And uh, it seems to be what people subscribe to us for. So, yes. Uh, yeah. So, but um, but yeah. So, if you're uh, if you're returning, welcome back. Uh, if you're new, what we uh, usually do is we uh, do some reviews. Uh, usually, something uh, new or newish, uh, and then something uh, classic or older. Uh, but uh, we couldn't really find anything newish to review uh, this week, so we just went with two classics. <laughs> yep. I guess we got X Men '97 to be our newish thing, so that yeah, that works. Oh, okay, yeah, it works. Yeah, uh, but uh, but before we get into all of that stuff, we would like to talk about box office. Yeah, and um, so I, I I kind of feel like Ghostbusters: Frozen Empire underperformed what I was expecting from it, based on how well received the last movie was. Yeah. Um, I was expecting it to be kind of like well, like Doom Two was in its first weekend, like in the maybe seventy, eighty million dollar range. Yeah, that's that. That's strange. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and take a quick look at what Ghostbusters Afterlife actually did. Well, that that one, that might be a little uh, a little weird because it was a COVID movie. Would you believe that it's only a million dollars behind a Frozen Empire, despite that? Uh, I, I find that hard to believe. <laughs> yeah. Uh, wow. Frozen Empire opened to forty-five million. Afterlife opened to forty-four. Hmm. Wow. So, um, yeah, we'll we'll see if it has the same legs. Uh, I'd say that all the reviews I've heard for this are is from eh to okay. Yeah. That, yeah. Same here. So, you know, maybe it's just, I, you know, I always said that in like the pre COVID days that Sony was like the worst movie studio in terms of like, if you just picked an average Sony movie, they were bad. And mm -hmm. then, and then it felt like for a little bit there that they were actually like putting out good stuff. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then we have Morbius, Madam Web, kind of what sounds like a mid Ghostbusters movie. Yeah. Um, they, they might be reverting back to form, which is a shame. Yeah, because you still have Craven the Hunter coming out, and uh, oh god, uh, you're right. And the uh, and good to see you, Ninja. And uh, no worries, uh, we're happy to happy to have you here. And also, happy belated birthday. Yes, yes, happy birthday. Uh, yeah, it's uh, they they it, you know they, they did seem like they did. Um, I think they have. I think they ended up soft canceling that one Luchador movie based on the Spider-Man villain who appeared in one storyline. Oh, yeah. From the from the Peter David run of the two thousands. Yeah, and uh, good to see you, Edwin. Oh, hey, Edwin. Yeah, yeah going down the list here. Um, so Dune Two is coming in softer than I think we were anticipating. Yeah, not not quite six hundred million. Um, after what? Yeah, this is its. That was its fourth weekend. Fourth weekend. Yeah, I I, I think it'll probably it probably be like six fifty seven hundred when it's all said and done. Yeah, it depends on how long they keep it in theaters. Um, yeah. I, yeah, I wonder. Uh, yeah, I don't know when it's going to drop on Max. That'd be interesting. Yeah, hopefully they were smart enough to give it some breathing room. Yeah, yeah, they're not gonna. It's not gonna be in May or you know June or mid April. Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. Um, I mean, I haven't gotten to see it yet, but that's just because I've been busy with things. There have been a couple of nights I've been tempted to go to the movie theater, but ended up not. 
Yeah, just for a variety of things. Um, but I'll say that, uh, I mean, there is a level where Dune is, is obs obscure is the wrong word because it's one of the most influential sci-fi novels of all time. Mm -hmm. Like it's big in a smaller circle of people might be the way to put it. Yeah. Well, I, I think the thing with it is it, it it's a very dense story. Uh, there, there are so many, um, so many moving parts and pieces to it and so many characters and, and the lore and everything that it's, I mean, I'm, I'm actually kind of surprised they've been able to condense it into two movies that are, you know, two and a half to three hours long, respectively. Yeah, that's, that's impressive. I mean, I remember watching part one with my dad when it came out and I haven't read the books and he did, and he seemed pretty pleased about, pleased about it as an adaptation. So, yeah. Uh, Ninja says uh, um, he doesn't think Ghostbusters as a franchise uh, is a strong money maker for theaters. Um, uh, yeah, and then also Dune Two, harder to sell a, a film that's part two uh, if you hadn't seen the first one. Uh, yeah, yeah, they, yeah, they did a good job of trying to make sure you had all the opportunities you could to see the first one because uh, they did a re-release a few months back, um, and they also. Uh, and they also had uh, Dune Part One on Netflix for a while. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, as far as yeah, Ghostbusters is an odd franchise, I think, because I don't think it was intended to be a franchise. Um, it, it it's you know it, it is in the '80s when things were basically designed to be one and done, and then sequels came about if it was successful enough. Like, is is it, I wonder if it's almost like Highlander, where it's like. No, we, we had a premise for a good movie, but money. Okay, um, now they're aliens. Now they yeah. aren't aliens. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and Edwin says he didn't see it, much hype for, for the new Ghostbusters. I didn't really either. Yeah, it, it, it's been very muted. Like I've heard people say, well, I like it, but... Yeah. Yeah, I... I um, yeah, I don't know. It, well, in the, and I think what, what really elevated i mean well first of all the movie was really popular when it came out in 84 i mean i think it was number one for like two or three months um right. and it had a lot of competition in 84 yeah i mean it was it was up against like uh, i think like star trek 3 and gremlins think, yeah. And, yeah 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 good um, year for movies yeah it was um i i think it was the cartoon show that really elevated the popularity especially with kids right because I mean, like you can only rewatch the same movie so many times, but if you know that that, that TV show is part of your Saturday morning ritual for years on end, mm -hmm. that's going to implant it more in your heart. Exactly. Yeah. And, and like Ghostbusters is actually, you know what? Okay, so Ghostbusters and Ninja Turtles are almost <laughs> two similar products. Mm -hmm. Where it's like they had their they had a peak in the '80s and then they kind of meandered through the '90s. The difference is that. Uh, Ninja Turtles has had a few different revivals that have caught on. Like the, that 2000s cartoon is beloved yeah. by people of a certain generation. Yeah, and and even the 2010s uh, cartoon show, people like that one too. Yeah. Right. It, it's like they've managed to see a whole bunch of Ninja Turtles fans over the years. Uh, Ghostbusters, it feels like they have a bunch of projects that do okay, but don't really catch the zeitgeist. Like how many people are aware that there was an Xbox 360 game for Ghostbusters that was based on their unfilmably expensive script for the third movie? Uh, probably, unless you're a hardcore fan, not very many. <laughs> right. Uh, how many people knew that? I, everybody knows about the 2016 Ghostbusters, but that's not a. Uh, <laughs> that's not necessarily a net positive. Yeah, yeah. And hey, hey, Bogdan, good to see you. Hey, man. Uh, I, I will read your I'll read your DM in a in a, in a at the end of the show here. Uh, he sent me a page update, so oh nice. Yeah. But uh, yes, I think Ghostbusters might just be a thing where it was lightning in a bottle, and they've been managing to uh, like run on vapors for <laughs> nearly forty years now. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I, I think a big problem with that was the second one wasn't very 
well liked um and they just really drug their heels on making a third one um right they they lost their momentum on it yeah and well and and well bill murray bill murray yeah that's what i was gonna say yeah bill murray really screwed around with that yeah he was off being a real actor Ooh. Mm. Mm. <laughs> and I, I seem to recall rick moranis uh also didn't want to show up in another one because he was just confused about why anybody would still care. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cause he retired and like, you know, I, Hey, he made his bag and he just wants to go enjoy his life. Have fun. Yeah. Well, well, yeah, well, yeah, there was a more tragic reason why he retired, but yeah. <laughs> I, don't know. I, I, I thought, I thought I'd heard nice things. Like he just wanted to spend time with his family. Uh, well, you know, he, he, he uh, do, do you want to know or it's, it, well, it, his wife passed away. Oh, okay. That, yeah. And he, okay. he wanted to spend more time with this with his kids. Yeah. Okay, then that's totally reasonable. Yeah. Um, moving down the list, uh, Kung Fu Panda Four. I'm. I think it's. I think I seem to recall hearing that it's performing worse than other movies in the franchise. Mm. Which, since I just heard people saying that script was mid to bad, yeah. not surprising. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, DreamWorks. You 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 really like blue. Okay. So you made a huge amount of money with the last Minions movie. Mm -hmm. Then you made a really awesome Puss in Boots movie that managed to, like, despite being killed by the weather and being released on streaming, made half a billion dollars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then back to back, we had um, Teenage Kraken, which was a bad movie, very yes. Tumblr style. Yeah. Uh, then we had... Uh, then... Universal, then the other uh, part of Universal gave us um, Migration, which was for the smallest of kids and has to be a huge disappointment for them. And then we have Kung Fu Panda 4 being phoned in. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, don't know. I mean, it's unfortunately, like, no wonder they're laying off half of DreamWorks animation staff. Uh, yeah. Mm. <clears throat> yeah. No, nobody likes to hear it, but it, it's understandable. Like, you, you had your chance to, like, really make a name for yourself and and you've just um it hasn't been very even yeah I, th I think that's the i think that's the frustrating thing with dreamworks if, if you're an animation lover is that like disney renaissance and that disney like i guess re-renaissance of like wreck it ralph and tangled and frozen and uh big hero six yeah. big hero six like those were like like they weren't always the all the best, but they had like a consistent. Um, but they had a con but they had like a consistency to them. DreamWorks yeah. has just never managed to really get that. No, it's it's always very yeah hit, hit and miss. Yeah. It, I I wonder if I, I wonder if it, part of it is that maybe maybe the they give they give the whoever's running the movies more independence. Cause I know that Lasseter was big during that. Like he, you know, he was basically running Disney studios and Pixar at the same time before he was sacked. Yeah. Uh, hmm. <laughs> and, and Ninja says, uh, I think the problem with Ghostbusters is that it's tied to specific actors as opposed to the concept of ghost busting. I'll actually go a step further. Uh, so the, the concept of ghost busting is actually, when you think about it, uh, possibly controversial for various families. Because, mm -hmm. like, if you're very religious, then the the way they're presenting Ghostbusters is very like nineteenth, twentieth, 20th century occultic stuff that uh, uh, that what's his name is really into. Uh, yeah, Ackroyd. Uh, Ackroyd, yeah. Um, if you're if you're irreligious, then like, you know, if, if your family is a bunch of ardent atheists. Uh, then, you, you know, do you necessarily want to fill your kids' heads with all that? Yeah. And and also, it, it inherently involves the concept of death. And, like, it's, a, it, it's an odd duck, and I think it was just kind of lightning in a bottle that hit at the right time. Yeah. Um, and, well, and, and, of course, it, 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 to get into the making of it, um, uh, you know, like Ackroyd's original concept for it was that it took place in the future, like in space, and Ghostbusters were kind of like like exterminators, and uh, and it was just really like 
off off the to- uh, uh, over the top and off the wall. And it wasn't until uh, uh, Ramus and and uh, Ivan Reitman came in and and cleaned it up. Right. It was basically unfilmable. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Let's see here. Um, so, so moving down the list, because um, yeah, we just have some. I think I think so I think Dune is going to do all right for itself, especially because it's something that's going to have legs. Because you know, it, it seems like the version of Dune that fans of the book are happiest with, besides maybe that sci-fi TV show from a few years back, which was a good show. Uh, I watched I, that. Yeah, I haven't seen it myself. Um, let's see here. So new release we got Immaculate. Oh, that's the. Uh, Sydney Sweeney, yeah. Okay. Getting the Sweeney bump or the bumps. It, yes. <laughs> uh, it, although it, it's it's her playing a nun, which is a little. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, you know, she's definitely uh, making sure that her name is staying in the headlines. That's true. <laughs> um, Arthur the King, uh, the dog movie with uh, Mark Wahlberg. Actually had a really good hold week over week for a small movie. Like, you know, forty four percent down. That's that's indicating some word of mouth. Yes. Yeah. Late Night with the Devils, another new release that came in at the top ten. Uh, uh horror movie. Yep, so no opinion. Well, not a very pretty low box office for that one. Um, Imaginary, another horror movie, kind of just trucking along. Yeah. Love Lies Bleeding. So this is part of that weird uh, age twenty four style thing where it just goes into more theaters as time goes on. Yeah, that's the that's a erotic thriller, I think. All oh, right, we're looking at yeah, uh, Cabrini, the Angel Studios one about that woman who became a, a the first American saint. Right. Yeah. Then Bob Marley, One Love, sticking in there. Uh, that one has a decent chance of hitting a hundred million by the time of its run is over because it's sitting at ninety five right now. Yeah. Uh, then, as far as other interesting things, uh, Disney decided to re-release Luca, which I didn't hear about. I didn't either. <laughs> um, maybe, maybe they saved the money on advertising because it's like, well, we can't <laughs> stop doing these Pixar releases. Yeah. <laughs> but we but we can waste as little money as possible on them. Yes. <laughs> um, and just for just for a comparison point here, um, the average per theater for the Luca this weekend was four hundred and two dollars. Um, if we scroll down the list here, uh, the Demon Slayer movie, which in its fifth weekend, when mm-hmm. these Demon Slayer movies are the last episode of the previous season and the first couple episodes in the next season, where you're paying for the privilege to go see it on a big screen. <laughs> um, but higher per uh, yeah, six hundred fifty per theater average versus four hundred for Luca. Ooh, <laughs> man, <laughs> yeah. Heck, uh, a a a re-expansion of the Boy and the Heron, probably trying to take advantage of it, winning that Oscar, mm-hmm. had a better had a also like about a six hundred dollar per theater average. Man. Uh. <laughs> Yep. Um, but yeah. Uh, so basically, kind of an uninspiring week. It's it's kind of reverting back to form. I, I feel like if they hadn't had the the strikes, we would have already seen some of these movies come out. Mm-hmm. I feel like they should have um, waited a little bit longer for some of these because. Yeah, yeah, Ghostbusters should have been a summer movie. I think. Oh yeah, uh, and Dune should have been a summer movie because yeah. You, so here's the problem: isn't Dune Part Two like? Around three hours. Yes. Uh, so the problem with releasing at this time of the year is that I, it's hard to, there aren't as many people who can take advantage of a matinee. Because, like, if I'm going to go see a long movie, starting at three o'clock makes a lot more sense than starting at six o'clock. Yes. Or later. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because you do, you got, yeah, if you start at three, you're going to, depending on where your movie theater is, I mean, you might, you, you might get home by like seven or seven thirty. Right, or if you have if you have traffic to worry about, you just walk out, and there's probably a restaurant right there. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, overall, kind of, it's it's not like an awful thing. Like most of these movies are actually in shape to do financially well, especially because 
except in the case of Warner Brothers, they don't have their own streaming services. Well, actually, no, Universal does have its own streaming service, but they like to share with Netflix too. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I think they'll all be fine financially in the end. But it's, yeah, just just kind of it was kind of exciting to have these big back to back releases where like the top uh, the top two movies were like 150 million combined or whatever. But yeah. I don't even think we're looking at 100 million for the top 10, all told. Just quick, oh, well, let's say 45. Yeah, probably quick back of the back of the napkin. We're probably looking at 80 to 90. Yeah. 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 Oh well, I'm not an AMC stockholder. Yeah, neither am I. <laughs> yeah. Now, Daniel, uh, surely you know what movie we're about to talk about. <laughs> I do. And don't call me Shirley. <laughs> <laughs> so this one, uh, yeah, we, we, we review the comedy classic Airplane. Yes. And the difference with this one is that for quite a few of these, uh, it's something that Daniel had seen before, or I had seen before, and we just, like, one of us is reviewing, one of us is fresh eyes. Yeah. yeah. I, I have seen this movie uh, quite a number of times over the years. <laughs> yeah, I had to, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so airplane is one of those things where it's a, an example of a good comedy that manages to um i'm going to call this the weird owl effect uh, what i mean is that when this movie came out in the 70s or actually it was 80. 70s, 80s oh that's right it came out as a response to a bunch of movies that had come out in the 70s because there was this whole uh trend of movies that were airplane disaster films yeah, like Airport 75 and yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> yep. And and uh, where it's the weird owl fact is that this movie has long since out outlived in the public consciousness any of the movies it's parodying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, it's like weird. There's a bunch of Weird Al songs where I only know the original song because Weird Al did a parody of it. <laughs> like, uh, I, I can't, I don't know if I've ever actually heard the song Stop Dragging My Car or My Heart Around or whatever that was. No, I remember the Weird Al version. Stop Dragging My Car Around. around. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so I think, so this is a story that would be slightly, um, slightly redundant to recount in detail because it's, it's the, it is basically Airport 75 where. You have uh, uh, well, combined with a few extra disasters where oh the, you know they're this uh, guy dealing with post-war PTSD is on an airplane and yeah. uh, uh, <laughs> and through a series of disasters he's the one who has to land the plane and he has to get over himself and fly an unfamiliar aircraft and oh will he get them down yeah and and um, and you also had the 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 girl who needs the heart transplant and <laughs> yeah. I, uh, and all sorts of other uh, just tragedies stacked up. Like, oh, if he doesn't land this plane successfully, so many things will go wrong. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, of course, he has a drinking problem. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so most of this movie, I would describe as having the driest of dry humor. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, now I forget. Uh, I know that Leslie Nielsen was also in the uh, was also in Police Squad. This was the same like writers and producers as Police Squad, right? Yeah, yeah, same guys. Yeah, yeah. So the logic of this movie is that, and, and this carried them through a number of successful comedies through the eighties and nineties, like The Naked Gun and things like that. Yeah. the The rule was, you can have the most ridiculous outlandish things happening on the screen possible nobody is allowed to do the modern millennial thing and say boy that was a thing yeah <laughs> i you, you like that was that was the rule for police squad from a little doc little like mini doc i saw from with leslie nelson was that um they, they, they weren't ever allowed to call out how strange something was right yeah and they weren't allowed to to laugh or smile uh, because because the, the the situation was serious and you know, they had to be serious about it. Yeah. Right, and, and this movie mostly keeps the same thing. Um, so th there were jokes, and you know, every time I watch this, I'm at a different age, of course, and I know different things. It's <laughs> so, like there's uh, little things like um, 
it's kind of amazing how some of the even some of the things that are references they manage to give you enough context to figure out what they are yeah uh, like even if you don't even know if it's a reference it's a reference it's still funny like uh like apparently like so the remember that bit where the woman is like her her husband is asked for a second cup of coffee and she thinks to herself my husband never offs uh, my, my husband never drinks a second cup of coffee at home yeah <laughs> and then later on after he eats the tainted food he's vomiting and she's thinking my husband never vomits at home uh, yeah <laughs> well that was based on a uh comedy or but that was based on a popular commercial at the time which was uh where my understanding is that the premise was that you would have somebody at a restaurant and um yeah, the wife thinks to herself my husband never orders a second cup of coffee at home and so they're trying to uh, i forget if they were trying to sell the coffee or trying to sell the restaurant yeah yeah, either, yeah, yeah. either way it was a riff on a commercial but it was well written enough that it's funny on its own uh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> um or like the Kareem Abdul-Jabbar thing, where you just have a celebrity there <laughs> pretending to be a character, but he breaks character. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> because the little boy keeps harassing him. My dad says that you only try during the playoffs, and you're kind of a slacker the rest of the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, you, you try dragging Walton and Lear and Lanier up and down the court. <laughs> and it's like, even if you had no idea who Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was, well, because the little boy actually says who he is and explains that he was a basketball player, what team he was on. Yeah. Uh, you have the context. Right. Yeah. Um, now, so on this rewatch, um, I, I wonder you know, how many times did I see an edited for TV version? Because I know they showed me, like, I know I've, I've, I seem to recall it was in some high school class where they played this during like the end of year or whatever. Like that yeah. must have been edited down. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it, I mean, it, it, yeah, it's pretty amazing. I mean, this the, the movie's rated PG. Um, of course, they didn't have a PG thirteen rating back then. Yeah, uh, yeah. So it was probably just barely under P, uh, barely under an R. Um, yeah, because there's some there there are some pretty like like dirty dirty things that are said in this movie. <laughs> this 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 is a perverted movie. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They also get, they also had a lot of fun with um, oh just things like putting people like putting kids in unusual situations like the like the twelve year old professional man and professional woman like uh, uh, do you want any sugar for your coffee uh, I like you black I like my yeah. men yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. New just says uh, the only bits he knows is uh, the Shirley bit and the and the slapping scene. Oh, yeah, the slapping scene. Yeah. Kind of hold it yourself. Smack it. Yeah, and Edward says that's a lesson the MCU movie should learn from. Yes, uh, that that is kind of the what I'll call the disease of um, of irony that a lot of millennial and Gen Z writers suffer from, which oh. is that. I think it's kind of the result of it's actually I would say it's actually kind of the same milieu that gives us so many isekai anime that are just riffing on other isekai anime where it's like if if you aren't like drawing from a real experience you're just doing riffs on other tv shows and movies and stuff you've read or watched yeah. so it's like well what if um actually I'll take it back to the 80s uh Alan Moore what if superheroes were, or what would superheroes actually be like? And the answer was, well, there'd be perverted weirdos who believe, who dress up in latex and get up to violent activities. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like this, this movie is like the exact opposite of that, where it's just so utterly sincere in its dedication to the premise. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and and uh, and how they do it too is is the fact that all the actors in this movie are, by and large, not, uh, dramatic act actors. They're not comedic actors, right? Like Leslie Nielsen revived his like the back half of his career after he stopped being a heartthrob, because of being in things like this that just took advantage of his kind of leaden '50s leading manness to yeah. sell the sincerity of these scenes. Right. Yeah. 
uh yeah and you also have like you know like robert stack and and mm -hmm. uh peter graves and um uh lloyd bridges uh another one yep there are also some things where um, i'd be like they have one scene early on where they just this is a par this is a riff from one of the movies they're parodying where they have an airplane take a wrong turn and just crash through a plate window oh yeah <laughs> Nowadays, they would have just done CGI, but like, I'm really curious how they rigged that up. Yeah, uh, like they, they had like a, a life-size nose cone of a Boeing jet go through the glass. <laughs> right. Yeah. And everyone has to scatter around. Like that. That must have been an expensive shot. Yeah, that was probably the most expensive shot in the whole movie. <laughs> yeah, which is weird because when I looked up the budget, uh, it, we're talking like three and a half million. Oh, that's that's nothing for so, for that uh, time. Yeah. I almost wonder, what if that was stock footage, or what if they actually got the footage from that movie? Oh, my! Or, oh, or, or, yeah. or it was a miniature, and they just used uh, clever Toho Godzilla monster movie perspectives for nonsense to make it look bigger. Yeah, probably. Yeah, a little little trick of photography. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think that we kind of both came away realizing that there was one actor who kind of uh, violated the rules of the movie a bit. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, it, yeah. What was his name? Stephen. Um, the, the late Stephen Stucker. Stephen Stucker. Yeah. Um, yeah. He played Johnny. I think was the name of his character, and he was uh, very, really goofy throughout the movie, and it just kind of. Right. Yeah. yeah right. It broke the it broke the the immersion kind of that they were going for. Right. It's like they were trying to. He was basically on the ground control, and every time he shut up, it's like he knew he was in a campy movie. Um, kind of Ryan Reynoldsing it up in terms of like trying to, uh, and definitely trying to go going for that kind of camp gay style. Yeah. Yeah. It just it it didn't work. Yeah. Yeah. What was the buying power of that three point five million? Um, not sure for the 1984 or whatever, but still, like, even if you, you know, multiply it 10 times, that's still, like, a pretty small budget. Yeah, no, yeah, that's, yeah, very, yeah, very small budget. Yeah. Considering that in a, in a similar year, Blues Brothers cost, what, 30 million when we looked it up? Yeah, something like that, yeah. Yeah, so, like, even, like, for a comedy at the time, this was still a small budget. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so I think that this is just good to know. You know, I say this is just a good example of the power of sincerity and not keeping an ironic distance from everything. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, speaking of things that don't distract you with irony. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so up until this show actually turns bad, I think that we're going to keep on watching X-Men 97. I think so too, yeah. Because <clears throat> um, for those of you who didn't see last week's episode, uh, we both at the end of that episode and we went, well, I want to see what happens next. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I've described this phenomena before where it's like, I'll occasionally watch a movie or a TV show and I think to myself, this is so good, it almost pisses me off because it reminds me that, like, because you can kind of convince yourself that, well, you know, maybe it's because I was younger when I was watching some of these things and they stuck their claws into me. And, yeah, you know, like I had that, I had that sensation with Godzilla minus one and Puss in Boots. It's like, this is so good. That, what, why, why is this so hard? Why is this so hard to do? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And I kind of had that sensation with this show because it's like, so this is a superhero show that is willing to like be kind of lighthearted at times, but takes itself seriously when it needs to take itself seriously. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I don't know what the deal is. Uh, yes, yeah, so I, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how to feel at this moment. <laughs> yeah, so... Um, so let's get into some uh, non-spoiler thoughts. Uh, so what this what this episode basically did was it, it what it seems like they're doing is they're blasting through some '80s and '90s Claremont storylines that they either couldn't or didn't have time to do back in the original '90s cartoon. Yes. Um, yeah. It, it's uh, you've got. Uh, 
course, I, I, I guess I don't know if this is it would be considered a spoiler, but um, oh, okay, Ninja says, yeah, the Goblin Queen. <laughs> he put it right in the comment. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, this is the Goblin Queen story, yeah. uh, slash Inferno. Um, like previous episode, they had the trial of Magneto. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting that Ninja mentions it as destructive. Uh, I think that by I will say that for spoiler thoughts when we get oh, yeah. more okay. into it. Um, interesting highlights of this one. Uh, I feel like the animation is getting better as they go along because they had a fight scene in basically the depths of hell that was and another one in a in an old church that were both like really awesome yeah um yeah like the one in the like in the mansion uh it actually reminded me of akira like when they all start hallucinating yeah yeah, yeah there was definitely some yokai reference it felt like a yokai reference when the elevator came down and it opened up and there was just an eye there it made me think of like a bunch of manga like things like um chainsaw man and things like that yeah <laughs> um so yeah that um I, i'd say the voice acting if the i actually yeah, i'm just gonna look this up one second yeah because it sounds like the guy who's playing wolverine is either doing a better job with his wolverine impression or the original voice actor is getting more back into the groove yeah i don't, I don't know um I, I, yeah, I meant to look up uh, who all the all right. voice actors are. Gen Jennifer Hale is Jean Grey again, and she's uh, doing an amazing job, which, considering yes. that Jean was kind of the nothing character from the 90s cartoon, the one who they didn't even give a superhero name. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ew. Uh, so this is a new voice actor. So he's okay. he's zeroing in on his wolverine oh wait no never mind this is the original actor oh it is the original okay so yeah he's uh getting back into the groove of it i guess yeah hey, he actually isn't that that much older than us uh 1977 oh wow yeah, wait that doesn't seem right one oh. second no yeah no, okay that's years active okay so he oh. isn't actually wikipedia doesn't know his birthday so they just have his okay okay Okay, right, that yeah. makes more sense. Uh, yeah, yeah. I was about to say he would have been like a teenager when when, the, when, yeah. the, show, when the original show was on. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, like I just was entranced the whole time. Uh, this the show is continuing to be worth watching, which yeah. I cannot think of the last bit of mainstream superhero entertainment I thought that with. Uh, yeah, yeah, especially on Disney Plus. Uh, yeah, um, but uh, and I, I actually remembered uh, something. So um, we talked. I think we talked about it last week with the with the creator of the show uh, getting mm -hmm. uh, getting fired a couple of days before the airing. Um, uh, Ninja says, uh, "Who even uh, remembers Jean's multiple superhero names? Wasn't she Marvel Girl? Yeah, Marvel Girl, Phoenix, and Jean Grey, yeah. which." I guess from the 90s cartoon, you don't want to call her Phoenix because that would spoil the Phoenix storyline that they hadn't gotten to yet. Right. Yeah. And, and Marvel Girl is kind of an odd superhero name for someone clearly in her 20s. So, yeah. <laughs> so but, it, uh, it makes enough sense to just call her Jean. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, the uh, Bo DeMeo was his name. And mm -hmm. um, I remember uh, like, when he was when they first started working on the show, he said, that, uh, if, "If you wanted to, the, if anyone wanted to work on the show, they had to be a fan of the original." And he wanted right. to stay true to the to the the original TV show, which um, so far he did a really good job with that. Um, it, yeah, like it's um, it's in keeping. Like and they're getting to do more adult cool things that they would never have gotten away with on Fox Kids. Oh yeah. <laughs> Um, so, so yeah, uh, so him getting fired was actually probably a bad thing. Yeah. Ho hopefully that whatever staff he assembled uh, for the, and he, the, you know, his hand is through the first two seasons at yeah. least. And hopefully whatever staff he assembled keeps up the, uh, keeps it up for season three. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now as far as, um, 
so as far as like the what I call okay so we tend to follow a lot of people who kind of decry things for being woke and sometimes we agree with them sometimes we dis disagree with them i will say that this show is managing to thread a needle i didn't think i would let it I, it could thread uh, mm -hmm. morph is very clearly gay uh, yes <laughs> <laughs> like the last couple episodes the first two episodes like okay yeah okay you know it's mm. I, but no, at this point, Morph is either gay or he is the type of uh, homophobic asshole who likes to uh, make jokes like he's gay just to bother people. Uh, yeah. Because <laughs> like, there's a scene where he like, he comes in on a Wolverine in the shower and offers to help him reach those hard to reach places. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, at the same time, it's like, do I do I find this upsetting? No, they never really gave Morph a um, a sexuality originally. No, and and I, I always thought he was a little you know odd or or you know different that way. You know when when I was watching yep. the show. Yeah. Um, now, if they actually put him in a relationship with Wolverine, then I will be unhappy. It, yes. I, that that would violate my sense of who Wolverine is, but so far it's just like it is a subtle thing that's in the show, and it informs the character, and I'm cool with it. Yes, yeah. Uh, now they very clearly have Wolverine still have uh, carrying a torch for Jean, so that's uh... yeah, that's yeah. Uh... But yeah, that's, like yeah. yeah, so they we managed to have a sexuality reveal of a character, and I did not mind it. Because yeah, <laughs> it's actually embed. You know what? Here, here's here's kind of the funny thing. One uh, one of the funny things about some of the uh, how to put it, you start associating certain elements with being bad, when the problem isn't those elements. It's the fact that you're watching bad media. Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, um, and this is actually how what kills trends. Like, you know, you had decades of good westerns mm -hmm. and then you suddenly had people like I, th I think there were years in the 60s or 70s where thanks to foreign uh cinemas or former foreign movie studios getting into it you literally had hundreds of westerns released every year of course you're going to drown out the good content with crap and of <laughs> course you're going to overload the market uh, people yeah. are going to start assuming that they don't like westerns yeah or it's like all the people saying, man, I hate superheroes now. No, you don't hate superheroes. You hate bad superhero media. And you're starting to assume that superhero media is bad. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's like this show is doing a good job of uh, making me question some of my assumptions about things. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Um, and uh, Ninja said, yeah, Morph was barely in the original show. Um, right. Yeah, I mean, he. Uh, when did he come? When did they bring him back? Like the third season? Yeah, somewhere in there. It was it was like Mr. Sinister brought him back to life. Yeah. Which they call back to in this. Yes. <clears throat> yeah, uh, so if you don't want to know anything about this episode, of course you'll have to watch the first couple episodes to know what's going on, but um, mm -hmm. overall this, this stepped it up in a bunch of ways. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, spoiler time. Yes. So, uh, Ninja described the original Goblin Queen storyline as very destructive to Cyclops, and he isn't wrong. Yeah. <laughs> uh, are you familiar with that one? Uh, not, not really. Um... Okay, so I've read, I've read the storylines where they introduced Madeline Pryor and a little bit of Inferno. Okay. Uh, so basically, what happened was uh, Jean Grey died on the on, on the moon. Okay. Scott was sad. Scott ended up leaving the X-Men after Storm beat him in a fight and took over the team. Because they basically, like, they were both arguing about who should be the leader of the X-Men, and they settled it with a fight in the danger room. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so he goes up to Alaska, and he meets a redhead named Madeline Pryor, who is, who is suspiciously a dead ringer for Jean Grey. Oh yeah, okay. Uh, I, I, I'm starting to remember it a little bit of that. Yeah. Um, so time passes. The two of them eventually get married, and they have a son who they name Nathan. Okay. And then I, I forget who had this brilliant idea, but someone like someone basically took his high school comic book club's 
idea of how to bring Jean Grey back to life by saying, "Oh, that wasn't the Phoenix. The real Jean Grey has been in I has been in a uh, suspended animation for a long time." Mm. So Jean Grey got brought back in of all things a Fantastic Four comic because I think John Byrne was writing it at the time and he liked the idea. Ah, okay. Um, and then you then then they had X Factor, which X Factor was the original X Men team. And in the pages of X Factor, you now have Cyclops, who is married to a twin of his dead wife, or of his dead ex-girlfriend, who he is married to and has had a child with, but he is feeling closer to the real version of what he wanted on the team. So um, I always I always kind of forget this storyline when I feel like it didn't make sense for Cyclops to cheat on Jean with Emma Frost. Yeah, uh, yeah. But, but I, I guess it goes back to the '80s with him not being the most loyal guy. Yeah, yeah. and uh, yeah, Ninja says uh, he's a, a Cyclops Malin Pryor Stan. <laughs> yeah. So, so um, now the the benefit that this has, as far as not destroying Cyclops's character, is that because they've basically compressed the whole thing down, where what appears to be a clone of Jean Grey shows up, but testing quickly shows that she's the real one and the gene that he uh, had a baby with is not the real gene. Right. Yeah. Um, you, ba you basically very quickly bring that to a head. It's not like he's having to deal with the two of them around for months on end. Right. Yeah. And um, they, are, they also are very clear. Like, we don't know when we got switched. Mm-hmm. So that basically means they don't have to cite a time when this happened and they can kind of move on from it. So, yeah. so Scott is like, so Scott, it's, it's not even clear if Scott could be like, Scott is kind of blameless in this insofar as like, it's not like he cheated on anybody because how could he know? Right. Yeah. Yeah, he. Yeah, she thought she. She thought he thought she was Jean Grey. Yeah, and she thought she was Jean Grey. Yeah. Um. Now, as far as uh, subplots are continuing, Gambit is still jealous of Rogue and Magneto, and was worried something is going on there. Yeah, because there's there's a, a part in there where they the uh, Gambit, Wolverine, and and Morph are walking out of the danger room and. And uh, they're like, oh, let's book the danger room. And they see like Rogue and Magneto have booked, the, booked it solid for like the next three days. <laughs> yeah, which is weird. Yeah. <laughs> to be fair, I suppose it's possible that, um, well, actually, was that before or after um, Madeline went crazy go nuts under Mr. Sinister's influence? Uh, I think it was just before. Or... Okay, so yeah, that wasn't Madeline Pryor starting to mess with their perception of things because that's yeah. kind of unrealistic. Uh, yeah, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so yeah, Mister Sinister is basically the all the voices that she's heard in her head, and he forces her to steal Nathan and come to him. Right. Yeah, and she she gets her her Goblin Queen outfit, which uh, I'm I'm surprised they went there with that. Yeah. <laughs> This is definitely being made for an older audience. Like it's like they're basically going, okay, anybody who's interested in this is going to be forty by now. Uh, yeah, <laughs> especially if they are hip to the X Men comics we're referring to. Yes. Yeah. Um. So then, uh, uh, so you get some cool set pieces where they are fighting Madeline's illusions. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they feel like they've been drawn down into hell, and you get everybody gets to do some cool stuff. Yeah, they, there's a yeah cool little part where where Cyclops powers up Bishop with his uh, optic blast. Yeah, I, I remember thinking to myself, wouldn't that be just as powerful to have Cyclops blast them directly? And I said, shut up, nerd. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> let, let Bishop have a moment. Yeah. <laughs> what I'll say is that uh, Bishop is able to go dual like double barrel with his hands at the same time so that's right. the that's yeah. the advantage of juicing him up yeah yeah <laughs> um and then you have a cool fight scene with magneto trying to use his magnetism versus madeline Pryor's telekinesis in a church yes it's actual and, blood uh, yeah that was that was surprising yeah <laughs> 
actually a fair amount of blood. Yeah. Um, the other thing is that um, what what people were saying, you know, morph is gender fluid. What it seems like they're using morph to do. Uh, so in the original Inferno storyline, uh, Colossus's sister um, Iliana gets gets brain whammied and. I think because of the nature of her magic that she wields, she um, she was vulnerable to whatever was going on with the Goblin Queen. Not not a storyline I've read too much. Mm, yeah. Um, and then, um, but uh, the reason I mentioned magic is that Morph turns into her, and so first he shows up in her like New Mutants costume. And it seems like Morph can, when he, when he turns into somebody, he can manifest metal. Yeah. Cause, like, yeah, because he, he turned into Colossus in the what, first or second episode, and he and he was Colossus in his metal form. Yeah, and he was he also fought as Psylocke, I think, poss yeah. with a sword as well. And so yes. it's, it's like if he can turn like parts of him into a metal sword, that's actually pretty powerful. Yeah. But uh, so they basically had him turn into magic. Then Goblin Queen gave him a brain whammy, and he turned into magic in her alternate uh, evil costume that they like to whip out every so often. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so that what I feel like they're doing with Morph is he is their way to throw member berries at the audience for people who uh, you know know that like who would be disappointed by a version of the Goblin Queen storyline that didn't have magic getting. Uh, you know, turning into that. Yeah. So it's a way to include characters they don't have the space for. Right. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, you do have Jean helping break Madeline out of it. And then they rush into, um, oh, uh, Mr. Sinister has infected their son, Nathan, with the techno-organic virus. And they have to make the hard choice of, you know, they've been... Early on in the episode, they set up that they were getting Bishop his time bracelet so they could send him into the future to, you know, so he could go back home. Yeah. And now it's like, well, he can bring Nathan with him, but Cyclops is just torn up by the idea of having to uh, give up his son and abandon him the way his father abandoned him. Right. Yeah. And uh, yeah, very, very tear jerking scene. And um, of course, uh, and, and if, you know anything about the X-Men lore, you know, Nathan is Cable. Cable, yeah. Yep. So uh, I forget, they, they didn't actually, did they actually get to where Bishop went back to the future with him, or is that to be seen yet? Oh, when he, uh, Bishop going to the future with yeah. um, Nathan? Nathan, yeah, yeah, he, he goes goes to the future, yeah. He did leave, okay. I, I think did, I must yeah. I must have looked away there, because... You know, maybe there was something in my eye after watching Madeline say goodbye to her son in a uh, yeah. <laughs> in a serene telepathic mindscape. Yes. <laughs> and uh, we got the teaser for next time, which uh, they're playing around with. Uh, so they had Storm lose her powers last episode. Yeah. Originally, that was due to a machine made by Forge. And so Forge was trying to help her get that back in the comics. Well, mm. Forge meets her in a bar in Dallas and offers to help her out. So... Yeah. Uh, so I wonder if we're going to find out that I, the way to mine some drama out of that would be to, that, oh, he was the one who designed the device that took away her powers permanently. Probably. That, that yeah. those mutant terrorists were using. Yeah. But uh, yeah, uh, so I'd say it was very satisfying. Mm -hmm. Some some cool set pieces. And we were talking before, it's not about the ideas about execution. I was like, man, I hate these stupid set pieces. Like no, okay. that was that was cool because they are using the characters' powers in cool ways. Yeah, yeah, they're <laughs> yeah they're they're very creative that way. Yeah, what, uh, the writers are they, they 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 know their X Men and they know their the power sets and and where to put them to get the most uh, effective uh, use of them. Yeah, and I'll, I'll say that unlike the first episode where they kind of had some goofy stuff like what Beast was doing with those Sentinels. They haven't they haven't gone there again, so I think that they might be uh, honing in on the tone of X Men a yeah. little better. Yeah, I would say the one criticism you could make is that they're kind of burning through storylines very quickly. Because in a differently paced show, this whole Madeline Pryor Inferno thing could have been a 
like that could have been the whole season subplot. Yeah. So I, I have seen some comments from people who are disappointed that they are fast forwarding through Inferno. Mm -hmm. On the plus side, I mean, like like uh, Ninja said, this is a destructive storyline for Cyclops. Yeah. Yep. And what they managed to do was boy gets off damaged, but but morally scot free to uh, <laughs> <laughs> to, to uh, you know pardon the pun. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> Yeah, you don't want you don't want to be the, to be too uh, to be do to be too devastating to the point where there's just you know they're it's no fun to watch them anymore. <laughs> right, like he 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 didn't um, he didn't abandon his wife and child this time around. Right. Yeah. Um. And uh, yeah, uh, Ninja says uh, Wolverine now is the chance of Madeline Pryor. See, I don't think so. Just because Madeline uh, is very intentionally um, walking away from her old life, mm -hmm. and hooking up with Wolverine would definitely be part of her old life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Ninja says, "I'm happy that Madeline was not evil." I will say that the one thing that struck me as weird was that I, I uh, they she just came up with that name seemingly out of thin air. Yeah. I that could have maybe used like a little bit more lines. Yeah, yeah. Like you know, maybe maybe when she's talking with Jean Madeline, like our grandmother, you know, something like that. Yeah, yeah. And and prior, like, oh, that's mom's maiden name. You know. Yeah, just. Uh, yeah. Yeah, she just comes up with a. Uh, yeah, that could have been them bonding over it a little bit. Or. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Uh, fun little detail someone noticed uh, they had a flashback to Jean as a kid getting recruited by Professor Xavier do you, do you notice what kind of doll she was carrying oh I saw it but I can't remember what it was it, it was a little like it was like a little monster with one eye so it's like it's, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and this this show is fun it's full of fun little eagle eye details like that yeah yeah <laughs> um, so oh it's a emergency amber alert, alert. fun oh. um but um yeah so like i like guess like they're using so they go back kind of go back to the morph thing you know the prediction like oh morph is gender fluid morph does seem to like to choose uh female forms to fight in more often than male forms hey, yes he does <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we're three versus one so far because yeah. Psylocke um, and Magic, and I think there was another one from the first episode who, besides Colossus. Yeah, I can't remember who that was. But yeah, but uh, but again, like I'm, I'm not minding it. It's uh, yeah. It now, if they have the very special episode, no, where <laughs> where it's entirely focused on Morph coming out. Actually, actually, no. Even then, these people are actually giving me enough faith that I think they could make that interesting. Yeah, they could. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, uh, the other the other bit of praise I'll give them is that uh, while Sunspot and Jubilee haven't been heavily in focus, <clears throat> they show up. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the, 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 like, the show is good at reminding you that, no, no, we didn't forget that these characters exist. They're just in the background right now. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and uh, it, yeah, it'd be interesting if they keep up with that whole thing with Morph turning into the different people, or if they actually do bring some of those characters in at some point. Right. Um, I, you know, I seem to recall they did something similar with Mystique, where like when she was shape shifting, she was turning into different characters they didn't get a chance to use. Right. Yeah. Which does open questions like. How does he know what a Psylocke looks like? How does he know what a magic looks like? Yeah. <laughs> he, he even knows that she should have a Russian accent. So uh, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, they're nice little continuity nods for the old heads. Yeah, indeed. So, yeah, um, I'm, I'm thoroughly enjoying myself. And I was not expecting to say that about a Disney Plus cartoon that's bringing back a franchise I love this year. Uh, yeah, <laughs> same here. I would be very curious to know how much influence uh, Feige's crew actually had on this one, because it feels like they're 
presence is entirely absent because there are like little moments of levity, but there is no boy, that was a thing. Uh, yeah. This. Right. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, I, yeah, I'm looking forward to the next episode. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Daniel, uh, I have an important question for you. Yes. Who is your daddy and what does he do? <laughs> <laughs> It's not a tumor. It's not a tumor. <laughs> um, so this is this is part. This is more of a typical classic movie review where uh, Daniel has seen it before and I have not. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't know if I, I don't know if I'd seen it all the way through. I know, uh, or maybe I had. I just don't I, didn't remember it. it it's, it it's not it like you'd seen back to me, but yeah. It's not like you'd seen more of it than I had at least. That's true. Yeah. Where my exposure to this one is uh this is a this movie has some very memeable moments, and I've seen a lot of people like use little clips of it from different uh, in different YouTube videos over the years. Yeah. Boys have a penis, girls have a vagina. <laughs> and shut up! Shut up. <laughs> yeah. So uh, this is a. So this was a. Was this another Reitman movie? Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, we talked. We talked at length about Ghostbusters earlier, so it fits. Yeah. I want to say this was the second Ivan Reitman and Arnold Schwarzenegger collaboration after Twins. Uh, I believe so. Yes. Because yeah. I think I think this one came out before the one where he got pregnant. Yeah. Um, this one was uh, 1990, I believe. And yeah, Junior, I want to say was 90. Four ninety-five. That sounds right. From yeah, when I looked up Reitman on Wikipedia a couple weeks back. Yeah. Um. So th this story is based on a uh, amusing premise, which is basically you take the world's biggest action star Arnold Schwarzenegger, and uh, you put him in the role of having to deal with a classroom full of thirty children. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Th Thirty-six-year-old children. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And. Uh, the the things that can go wrong right themselves. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but I say that the the opening framing device uh, is feels very different than the rest of the movie. I think that's on purpose. Uh, I think yeah, I think so too. Yeah, because yeah, Daniel, I've been enjoying on enough. Uh, oh yeah, um, yeah. So yeah, like the first yeah the first part of the movie is uh schwarzenegger's uh, character john kimball he's a uh lapd cop and he's uh tailing a criminal um named uh crisp and uh he's following him through a mall uh and yeah it's it, the uh, and crisp is trying to uh he meets with this kind of like low life kind of guy in the back of the in the back of the mall and uh tells him about like you know he said oh yeah i saw your ex and in uh his, his ex-wife and and their kid and their kid and and he's really interested in where it is where they are and then he tells him and then shoots he shoots the guy and then uh you know uh schwarzenegger's chasing him through the mall and then uh eventually arrests him uh at the the salon with where his mom is getting her hair done um and uh and then so then the, and then arnold meets his uh his new uh partner who was a woman uh i can't remember what the name of her character was um um i was just looking that up um uh, here we go it was penelope ann miller as uh joyce oh. palmieri Oh, that, that that's the um the oh, love damn it. You're right. Okay. <laughs> Heidi. Heidi Swim. Heidi. No, no, that's Joshua's mother. How far down the list list it? Oh, here we go. Pamela Reed as Detective Phoebe O'Hara. Phoebe. Okay. Phoebe O'Hara. Yeah. And um And I, I would have thought that Wikipedia would have listed Phoebe earlier than the love interest. Uh yeah. Considering <laughs> <laughs> she's a bigger part of the movie. Yeah. Uh, uh but uh yeah, so um they find out that uh, his uh the criminal's ex-wife uh, is, and her and their son is in uh, Astoria, Oregon. Of course, the problem is they don't know who who she is. They don't know what she looks like. They don't know what the kid looks like. Yeah, uh, yeah. And so, uh, 
so Arnold and his partner and Phoebe, they uh, they have to go to Astoria, and uh, they they establish that the the kid is going to school. Uh, he's in the kindergarten at the school, and uh, and so they're trying to find out like, okay, well, who's uh, you know who the kid is. And uh, so she, at first she was going to be teaching the kindergarten because she has experience as a teacher. Uh, but then when they land in Portland and then they're driving to Astoria, she gets a very violent case of, of food poisoning. <laughs> so he so now Arnold is the one who has to teach the class instead. Right. They make the switch at the last possible minute. Yeah. Yeah. And it is kind of interesting. Uh, it's like the, the first, they spent a, a longer time on the setup than I was expecting. Yeah, they did. Um, yeah, because you're, you're kind of like, you know, it's, because what it was, it was like 30 minutes into the movie, I think, before they finally get to yeah Portland well, or get to Oregon or Astoria. At least 30 minutes before he uh, actually starts teaching the class. But yeah, yeah the, but like uh, they do a good job of setting up Crisp as the, the, drug dealer as a violent asshole uh, yes the, they establish his mother as a controlling force in his life yeah, um, and, yeah. uh, they establish that arnold is also a jerk because uh oh he has this witness who refuses to testify and he just shows up at a drug den she's at and starts blasting things with his shotgun yeah <laughs> i'm your best friend where i'm going to be hanging out with you all the time we'll get to know each other very well <laughs> basically bludgeoning her into into testifying or, yeah <laughs> yeah um and, and well yeah and if you notice when he was going through shooting and stuff he he didn't shoot anybody like nobody actually gets shot in there yeah. right he just shot around people yeah um yeah this movie has a very low body count i noticed yeah um really just uh yeah yeah but i think um, three three or four yeah oh yeah four four yeah um uh but um yeah like so it's like it's interesting because it takes a while to get to the title premise which is you know he's having to be uh be a cop right or right. be a teacher right yeah and, and as somebody who tried and decided that teaching was not for him um i, I definitely uh it was a weird okay so i was dealing with asshole eighth graders <laughs> so this is so it's like these kindergartners were both more needy but also like sweet and liked him or, or wanted to like him yeah <laughs> so uh this is it was like the warm and fuzzy version of what i was dealing with uh yeah yeah i, I wouldn't i wouldn't want to deal with asshole eighth, grade, eighth graders either i didn't yeah. i didn't want to when i was in the eighth grade <laughs> yes <laughs> But um, and so you, you have kind of some predictable shenanigans. Uh, you know, Schwarzenegger is a rough and tumble cop who doesn't like people. Like I think that as long as that opening scene was, you had to establish that he's a violent man who is not afraid to shout and intimidate to get what he wants. But then you mm -hmm. put him with the, like the group of people who that is not going to work on. <laughs> no, yeah. they're just going to cry. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which is what happens. Yeah, when he yeah the yeah when he yells at them to shut up, they're all just like. <laughs> uh, and he makes the mistake of leaving them alone for two minutes and everything just goes to chaos uh, yeah <laughs> uh and so like the big charm of the movie is just watching him interact with this classroom of kids and you know slowly bond with them and, and he figures out how to reach them by basically turning classroom into police boot camp uh, yeah <laughs> from now on we're doing police school Yes. When I blow the whistle once, you can go and get a toy. When I blow the whistle twice, you take the toy back. Yes. <laughs> He's making a march around that. One, two, three, four. <laughs> I don't know what I've been told. <laughs> yes. uh, so in the, in the background of this, you have a few other plot lines going on. Uh, you you do have like a little. You do have some red herrings about who the um, mother and the child could be. Yeah. Because. Uh, it, 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 it just occurred to me right now. This was a total like setup. Oh, yeah, story is the single mother uh, capital of the world. Because uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you need to, you needed you know it couldn't be somebody who had a you know had a husband and it had to be people who he could interact with. Yeah, and like, supposedly the the Crisp's uh, wife had stolen 
$3 million from him. So it's like right. you're looking for signs of somebody who was throwing money around, and there was this one woman who was. Right, yeah, and and um, yeah, he had the 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 son who uh, liked to play with. She was worried about her son because he liked to play with dolls, and he said, yeah. "Oh yeah, he uses the dolls to look up girls' skirts," and, and that re went, oh. that relieves her. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she was like, oh, shoot. <laughs> which struck me as a funny reaction. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you got you got some uh, so you got some uh, fish out of water stuff with him. Mm -hmm. Uh, the character who I thought was the strangest was uh, was actually uh, Phoebe, uh, his partner. Like her character, her characterization was that she was a food addict because she was hypoglycemic, so she was constantly eating. Yes, and uh, yeah, and there's a very awkward scene in there where her her fiance shows up, and her... yeah, this, the, 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 did she meet this fiance in town? Like... Uh, no, uh, uh, no, I think they already they're already knew each other and and he just like flew he, in. He, he flew in to yeah to visit her okay because i wasn't clear on that because i almost thought did she just get bored while she was waiting for arnold to find <laughs> out things and decide to get herself a fiance who was a chef <laughs> <laughs> that would have been funny but no, 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 no i think i think they were already like together before yeah before that which uh, that is an awful idea to fly your spouse when you're trying to be undercover uh yeah <laughs> <laughs> let's see here um uh, i actually don't really have a whole lot to criticize this movie for it the opening seemed overlong but in retrospect you did have to establish some things about the world and the characters right yeah um and i i will say it kind of uh, i i might have been a little a little too cutesy at times but um but overall no i i didn't i don't have too many criticisms of it i'll i'll give them some extra um, praise for the villain crisp because mm -hmm. they did a good job of establishing his relationship with his controlling mother yeah who um who was definitely like in on his crimes and was also a monster in her uh, in her own way yeah yeah, and then um, yeah, there, there's a funny scene in there where they're at the pharmacy, and she's yeah. buying like all this like children's medication, like children's at child and all, and and yeah. you know all antihistamines and <laughs> yeah, yeah, and he, he's like, like mom, you forced this this stuff down me, and then nothing, and I never got sick or anything. It's because I forced this stuff on you that you <laughs> never got sick. <laughs> Yeah, it's definitely controlling, and you can kind of see where um, his more violent tendencies came from and his own yeah. desire to control his son and family. Yeah. yeah. Um, also, the sidebar, he looks exactly like a very unhinged former coworker I had. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so it's interesting. You kind of have, like, like, the movie starts off as an intense crime drama almost like a serious version of 48 hours yeah yeah uh, then it turns into a cutesy fish out of water comedy with arnold dealing with the little children's yeah <laughs> and then it serious is up at the end yeah and one thing i'll give this movie a lot of credit for it is very good with, with the setup and payoff it is yeah like uh they have a scene where um one little boy you know, oh, when the bad people show up, I, I have these devices that make lasers that keep them away. And mm -hmm. um, oh, and he thinks the bad people are showing up. He climbs up the water tower like he said he would. Yeah. Uh, they had a Schrodinger's ferret that was introduced early on, who was oh, yeah. Arnold's pet, and they make good use of it in the finale. Yeah, yeah. And um, there's a there's a scene with uh, where they're doing a fire drill and. Yep. I, yeah, he, that, like a, I think what the hard ass principle is that, oh, you know, the, the kindergarten class is terrible at the fire drill and she lays into all the students for not doing well with the fire drill. And yeah. in the end, they do have to do a fire drill. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah, uh, overall, this was a, this was a charming movie. Um, I, I, I can, you know, we were, we were talking before the show and uh, I compared to this, uh, I, I felt like I enjoyed this one more than twins. Uh, for you kind of had the opposite opinion yeah uh, yeah i i i enjoyed i enjoyed twins a little bit better uh, than this one but i mean i can i can understand why you'd like like this one uh, 
I think this is definitely a case where um, like I was finding all the stuff with him and the kids charming where you were thinking it was like a little bit too cutesy. So yeah. that, 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 that's probably the difference. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> But overall, uh, it, it's always refreshing when you watch a movie that you mostly know by the memes and the parodies, and it turns out to actually be worthy in and of itself. Yes, <laughs> indeed. It, it's not high art, but it you know it promises you a out of a fish out of water comedy with Arnold Schwarzenegger and a bunch of cute kids, and it delivers. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> indeed. Yeah. All right. But, uh, you know, Daniel, I think this is the first time in a while where we, like, everything we reviewed, we mostly, yeah, we, we enjoyed. Like, yeah, yeah, that's, uh, it's, a, it's a, it's a nice change of pace from the, oh, this really sucked. Oh, this was terrible. Oh, yeah. 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 I, 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 like, or something, sort of, well, that was the one good thing we watched. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, well, you know, as long as X-Men 97 keeps up the quality, uh, well, that, that'll bring up the batting average. Indeed, yeah. All right, well, uh, uh, yeah. I think we're done here. Yeah, all, all right, cool. All right. Um, well, uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, for tuning in. We appreciate it, as always. Um, yep, nice. Oh, uh, do, 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 did you have that thing to show that Bogdan sent you, or did you want to show that thing that Bogdan sent you? Um, I, I kind of don't want to show it. It's a, okay, then. It's, yeah. it's, it, I, I will say it, it, it's a page from, um, from Guardian Angel Part 2. So nice. Yes. Um, but um, yeah, uh, uh, hit the like button, uh, subscribe to the channel. If you haven't already hit the bell, all that good stuff. Um, uh, happy Easter. If you are celebrating Easter and or it's uh, also Passover, if that's your thing too, isn't it? Uh, There's Passover. I thought that Passover was Easter weekend. Uh, sometimes it is. Sometimes it isn't. Let's find out. Passover 2024. Um, no, we are a month off from Passover. Okay. Okay. Then All never right. mind. Yes. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll um, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll see you all, uh, see you all next week. Later, yep. everybody. Later, everyone.